Welcome back everybody. Let's continue to talk about the one sample t-test. We've already covered quite a bit of ground. We've talked about the estimated standard error of the mean. We've computed degrees of freedom so that we can find our critical values. We've done examples with one-tailed and two-tailed tests. And we also did an example where we computed a 95% confidence interval. Let's do one more example. All right, let's see what we've got. Several years ago, a survey revealed that the average age at which students first tried alcohol was 14 years old. To determine if anything has changed, a random sample of students was asked about their alcohol use. The age at which they first tried alcohol is as follows. So we have data from five students from this year's class. Has there been a change in the population mean age at which drinking began? Test with an alpha of 0.05, two-tailed. It's pretty easy to see in this situation that theoretically the results could go in either direction, so it does make a lot of sense to do a two-tailed test. You can see in this example, we have raw data. So typically I give you some summary statistics, like a sample mean and a sample standard deviation. We're gonna have to compute that on our own in order to do this t-test. That should be no problem. Let's go ahead and change views and work on it together. All right, let's start at step one. Remember, we have two competing hypotheses, a null hypothesis and an alternative hypothesis. They are both stated in terms of population parameters, mu. We usually like to label that up so we know exactly what we're talking about. Remember, we know the population mean age from the past. We're trying to figure out the population mean age at which these kids first began drinking, and we're trying to get some current statistics. So I first asked myself, mean what? We're talking about the age at which they first started drinking. I'm just gonna label it age. And then I ask myself, for whom? We already have data from the past. I want current data. That's why we collected data from this current sample of people. So I'm just gonna put slash C, slash C, for the current crop of students. The null hypothesis always states no effect, no differences. So in this case, if the current group of students try to alcohol at the same age that we found in the past, then the population mean age would equal 14 years old. We're doing a two-tailed test, so the alternative hypothesis needs to include everything else. So in that case, the population mean age is something other than 14. In other words, it's not equal to 14. Well, that was easy enough. Let's move on to step two. Keep in mind in step two, we create a distribution of all possible sample means. And that distribution is based on the null hypothesis being true. Because we don't know the population standard deviation, we're going to have to estimate the standard error of the mean. That means instead of doing a Z test, we're doing a T test. So in this distribution of sample means, of course, we'll be plotting sample means, but we'll be transforming those into T values. We know, according to central limit theorem, that right here in the middle, we should find a sample mean equal to 14 years old and that would transform into a t-value of zero. We know there's some variability in this distribution, and that variability is measured by the estimated standard error of the mean. And we don't have enough information to compute that yet, but we will soon. Let's not forget the real reason we're at step two is to locate the critical region or critical regions. We're doing a two-tailed test, so we have two critical regions. We're using an alpha of 0.05, so let's mark off two critical regions. In order to find those critical values, we need to compute degrees of freedom first. And remember, degrees of freedom is based on our sample size minus one. Our sample size equals five, five minus one equals four. So we have four degrees of freedom. We need to know that because when we're doing a t-test, that sampling distribution, it changes its shape based on the amount of information we have, based on the amount of data that we have. So in order to find out where those critical regions begin, we first need to know degrees of freedom. Now that we have that, let's consult our T table. Here's our T distribution. We're doing a two-tailed test, so I want to look at these alpha levels that are listed right here. We're doing a two-tailed test with an alpha of 0.05. So this is the column that I'm interested in. Right over here is a column with degree of freedom values. I see four degrees of freedom right here. I wanna move out in this row all the way until I get to this column. So right there is the critical value that I'm looking for. So our critical regions are gonna be marked off 
at positive and negative 2.776. We've got 2.776 on the positive side and negative 2.776 on the negative side. So that's step two. Now, ordinarily, I would say we're ready for step three, but in reality, we need to do a little bit of prep work. We need to compute a few things before we can start computing our t-test. For example, we don't even know the mean yet. We need to compute the mean. And we also need to compute the estimated standard error of the mean. In order to compute the estimated standard error of the mean, we need to know the standard deviation. And in order to compute the standard deviation, we need to know sum of squares. So let's compute the sum of squares right now and let's compute the mean right now. Let's compute the sample mean first. Here's our formula right here for the sample mean. I need to know the sum of x and I need to know n. Here are my x values right here. Let's just add them up. We've got 11 plus 13 plus 14, 12, and 10. So the sum of x is 60. And we're eventually going to need to divide that by our n, which is 5, divided by 5, equals 12. So our sample mean is 12. Let's just write that in. The sum of x was equal to 60. That gave us 60 divided by 5, which gave us a mean of 12. So now we have a sense of what's going on. These current students, they're reporting drinking earlier in life, 12 years old compared to 14 years old. We need to ask ourselves, is that the type of difference we would expect just by chance, just due to sampling error? Or does that represent a true difference in the population mean drinking age of these students? We'll determine that soon. First, we need to compute sum of squares. Take a look at that formula. In that formula, we need the sum of x. We already have that. But we also need the sum of x squared. So let's compute that real quickly. I've got a little bit of room for it right here. I'm going to take every single one of those x values and I'm going to square them. 11 squared is 121, 13 squared is 169, then we have 196, 144, and finally 100. Let's go ahead and add up those values. 121 plus 169, 196, 144, and finally plus 100. That equals 730. All right, now we have everything that we need to compute sum of squares. The sum of x squared is 730. And now we need to subtract this fraction. Let's work out that fraction real quickly. In the numerator of that fraction, we need the sum of x, that quantity squared. So in other words, we need 60 squared. And we need to divide that by n and our n equals 5. So I'm going to divide by 5. So that fraction equals 720. So we're left with 730 minus 720, which gives us a sum of squares value equal to 10. All right, now that we have that prep work done, we're ready for step number three. Here's step number three. Ultimately, we need to take that sample mean of 12 years old and transform it into a t-value so that then we can figure out exactly where in the distribution it is. But just look at that formula. You can see that in the denominator, we need to know the estimated standard error of the mean. Now look at the formula for the estimated standard error of the mean. In order to compute that, we need to know the sample standard deviation. Okay, let's look at a formula for the sample standard deviation. In order to compute that, we need to know the sample variance. Let's look at a formula for sample variance. In order to compute sample variance, we need to know sum of squares, which we have, and we need to know the sample size, which we have. That's where we start. That's how you can always figure out where to start. We just computed sum of squares, and we found that it was equal to 10. And we know that degrees of freedom is simply n minus 1, so that equals 4. 10 divided by 4 equals 2.5. So now we know sample variance. We need to know sample standard deviation. That's simply going to be the square root of 2.5. Let's compute that real quickly. So I'll type in 2.5 and hit the square root key. That equals about 1.58. 1.58. Now, finally, we can compute the estimated standard error of the mean. 
we're going to take 1.58 and then we're going to divide by the square root of n, which equals 5. Let's go ahead and compute that real quickly. First, let's figure out the square root of 5. I'll type in 5, hit my square root key. That equals about 2.24. So we need 1.58 divided by 2.24. We'll do that next. 1.58 divided by 2.24 equals about 0.71. 0.71. That means on average, the sample means differ from the true population mean by about 0.71 years. Don't forget, we're measuring their age. We're measuring years. So in general, there's not a lot of variability. Now we have everything that we need to compute our t-test. We want to take that sample mean, 12 years old, and transform it into a t-value. So we're going to plug in 12. We're going to subtract that from 14. Remember, that mean, mu, is always based on our null hypothesis. And then we're going to divide that by 0.71. So when you look at that formula, the numerator is looking at the differences that we actually see, the differences that we actually observed. And then it's dividing by the differences we would expect to find just by chance. That's the standard error of the mean. We're left with negative 2 divided by 0.71. Let's crunch that out. I'll type in 2, make that negative, and then divide by 0.71. That equals about negative 2.82. Negative 2.82. All right, now we know exactly where our sample mean of 12 years old is. Let's go ahead and plot it. As we look at this distribution of all possible sample means, right here in the middle, we have a t-value of 0. Our critical region is marked off at negative 2.776. Our t value is negative 2.82, so we exceed that value. We are indeed inside the critical region. We are in the rejection zone. Let's write in those values just to make it clear. I don't have a lot of room to write in negative 2.82, but I'm going to find some room and do it anyway. And then remember, that's telling us the location of our sample mean. So that sample mean, x bar equals 12, that's where that's located. It is inside that critical region. Remember, this distribution of all possible sample means represents all the sample means we would expect when the null hypothesis is true. These sample means in here, they occur quite often when the null hypothesis is true. But these sample means in here, they do not occur very often when the null hypothesis is true. In fact, they make us question the null hypothesis. We found that this particular mean is in our rejection zone, so we are ultimately going to reject the null hypothesis. So let's ask ourselves those four important questions. That first question was, is our sample mean inside the rejection zone? And the answer is yes, we are in the rejection zone. If we answer yes to that question, we should answer yes to all of the follow-up questions. The first follow-up question is, should we reject the null hypothesis? Yes, we should. So let's reject the null hypothesis, we'll cross it out, and let's check off the alternative. We're going to embrace the alternative hypothesis. That hypothesis states that the population mean age at which kids first tried alcohol is something other than 14 years old. And in fact, we have evidence that it's less than 14 years old. We have evidence that it's closer to 12 years old. Next follow-up question, do we have statistically significant results? Yes, we do. So let's just jot a note down to ourselves. And then that final follow-up question, is it at least possible that we're making a type 1 error? And the answer is yes, it is possible that we're making a type 1 error. Anytime we reject the null hypothesis, there's at least some probability that we're making a type 1 error. In this case, because we used an alpha of 0.05, over the long run, as we make decisions based on this four-step strategy, we will make those type 1 errors about 5% of the time. There's just one more thing that we like to do before we write up our results. We're going to need to say something about the probability of finding our results just by chance. The probability is either going to be less than 5% or that probability is going to be greater than 5%. Let me remind you, our sample mean we found in that little small region so the probability of finding that data just due to sampling error should be based on a small probability. 
What's small, a probability less than 5% or a probability greater than 5%? I'm sure you would agree that P less than 0.05 is small, and we want to pick that for this situation. Let's write up our results. At step four, there are four important things we need to cover. We need to discuss if we are going to reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis. We need to discuss our results in everyday language. We need to show how our results would appear in a journal article. And we also need to compute the most appropriate measurement of effect size, which in this case is Cohen's D. We stated that we were going to reject our null hypothesis. Here's how I would put that in writing. I'd say that our sample mean of 12 years old is within that critical region. And that type of mean is unlikely to be found if the null hypothesis is true. And it meets our criteria, so we reject the null hypothesis. Everyday language, what did we find? There has been a significant change in the age at which drinking begins. On average, kids are starting younger. How would this appear in a journal article? Well, we did a t-test. So we're going to begin that little phrase with a T. That T test had four degrees of freedom, so we'll put that in parentheses. The T value that we computed was equal to negative 2.82, so we list that. The probability of finding that type of sample mean just by chance is less than 5% based on a two-tailed test. Let's talk about our measurement of effect size. In this situation, it's pretty easy to see the size of the effect. Kids are reporting drinking two years younger. But remember, Cohen's D standardizes that so that we can have a sense of how large that effect is across all kinds of studies. So let's compute Cohen's D. Cohen's D always has the same basic setup. We're going to look to see how big are the differences that we actually observed, and then we're going to put that in standard units by dividing by the standard deviation. We computed the standard deviation right here, and it was equal to 1.58. The difference that we saw was a difference of two years. So 2, negative 2 in this case, divided by 1.58 equals negative 1.27. So that two-year difference in age is a difference of about one and a quarter standard deviations. That's a very large effect size. So to sum up, we found enough evidence to say that kids are starting to drink earlier in life. They're not starting to drink at 14 we're finding evidence that they're starting to drink somewhere around 12. But keep this in mind, sampling error exists. If we were to collect more data, data from another sample, we'd find a different sample mean. It wouldn't be exactly equal to 12 years old. So even though 12 is a nice precise estimate, we have very little confidence that it's correct. So what we want to do is create a range of values, an interval of values, that has a very high probability of including that true population mean age. We'll do that in step number five. Before we go through the computations, let's talk about the rationale. We rejected the null hypothesis, which means we concluded the population age of having your first drink is not 14 years old. We're going to use that sample mean of 12 years old to create a range of values that has a 95% chance of including the true population mean age. This is the formula that we're going to use. We're trying to find out that true population mean age at which kids are first starting to drink. We're going to start with our sample mean, 12 years old. And then we're going to add the product of these two values. We'll multiply those two values. We're going to take that critical T value that we used previously and then multiply by the standard error of the mean. Let's look back at that distribution of sample means so that you understand why we're using those values. We're going to use this critical T value because it's that value that marks off the middle 95% of the distribution. So what we're doing effectively is starting that distribution right in the middle at 12 years old, and then adding some to it, subtracting some from it, so that we have a range of values very likely to include the true population mean age. Let's first compute that upper limit of the confidence interval. So we're going to start with 12 years old, our sample mean. We'll take 2.776 and multiply by that standard error of 0.71. That leaves us with 12 years old plus 1.97. So the upper limit of that confidence interval is 13.97 years old. 
Let's compute the lower limit of that confidence interval. Again, we're going to start with that sample mean of 12 years old, but now we're going to subtract 2.776 multiplied by 0.71. That leaves us with a lower limit value of 10.03 years old. Look very closely at that range. What value do you see that is not included? What is not included is 14 years old. We rejected that value in the t-test that we just computed. But do you recall, when we transformed 12 into a t-value, it was just into that critical region. It just surpassed that critical value. And you can see when we look at this confidence interval, 14 is just outside of it. So if we had to pick one number, our best guess is that kids first try alcohol when they're 12 years old. If we wanted to have a higher probability of guessing the real age, we'd say it's somewhere between 10.03 and 13.97. But do you see how that's a pretty big range? When that range is larger, we essentially have less certainty in that estimate of 12 years. But if that range was very close to 12 years, we would have more certainty in its value being the true value for the entire population. Let's interpret this confidence interval. Remember, there are three things that we want to address. First, we need to say something about the probability. A 95% confidence interval is different than a 99% confidence interval, for example. Then we also need to say something about what it is exactly that we're measuring. And of course, we're measuring the population mean age at which kids first started drinking alcohol. And then finally, we need to list the values for the confidence interval. If you put that all together, a good interpretation looks like this. The probability is 0.95. Or in other words, we can be 95% confident that the population mean age of first drinking is somewhere between 10.03 and 13.97 years old. In a journal article, that confidence interval would be summarized this way. 95% confidence interval, and then in brackets, the lower value, a comma, and then the higher value. This is a pretty good strategy. 95% of the time, when we create these confidence intervals, we will include, within that interval, the true population mean. Well, my friends, that's example number three. That was a lot of work, particularly because we had to compute everything by hand. We didn't start with any summary statistics at all you should be able to do examples like that. In the next brief video, we'll wrap up our discussion of the one sample t-test. I'll see you in that next video. In the meantime, be safe.